time to actually start designing the next 10 years of your life. We're going to start setting your goals. Goal setting is one of the most important skills to develop if you want to design your future. I'm going to give you enough homework not only to keep you busy for the rest of your life, but also to help you create the kind of life you may have always dreamed about living, but never believed possible. So let's get on with it. The sooner you exert the discipline, the sooner you will be enjoying the results. Once the results start to come, believe me, you won't mind the hard work and discipline it's going to take. Now, get a sheet of paper, and at the top of it, write the words, long-range goals. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to jot down the answers. If you don't have paper and pen handy, follow along with me now anyway, just listening. Then, later, listen again when you can write down your ideas. After I've asked the questions, which is the first part of this exercise, you can stop the tape and work on your answers. All right, let's start this exercise. The basic question you are going to answer is, what do I want within the next one to 10 years? I want you to take about 12 to 15 minutes and make a list of at least 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. To help you get started with your list, consider these questions. What do I want to do? What do I want to see? What do I want to be? What do I want to have? Where do I want to go? And what would I like to share? Now, with these thought starter questions in mind, answer the basic question. What do I want within the next one to 10 years? See how many things you can write down. At this point, don't take the time to describe in detail everything you want. This is the time for you to let your thoughts pour, to write fast and to abbreviate. For example, if you just write down 380, you'll know what that means. You don't have to describe the color and the interior of the car. You'll do that later in this exercise. I want you now just to abbreviate and write fast. Make the list as long as you possibly can. Try to write down at least 50 items, 50 things you want within the next one to 10 years. These are long range goals. Spend about 12 to 15 minutes on this. After you've completed your list, you're ready for the next part of the exercise. Go through your list, and next to the things you think you can accomplish or acquire a year from now, write a number one. Next to the things you think it will take three years to realize, write a three. Next to the things it will take five years to accomplish, write a five. And next to the things it will take 10 years to accomplish, write a 10. Go through this list now to the best of your ability and say, that looks like it will take me about a year or three years or five years or 10 years. Some big goals might be out there 10 years from now. Once you complete this part of the exercise, you might come to the conclusion that you need a lot more three-year goals and less one-year goals, for example, or that you need more 10-year goals. You see, while you're working on one goal, you must have something else in the planning stages. If you don't, what happened to some of the early Apollo astronauts could happen to you. After they came back from the moon, some of those astronauts experienced deep psychological and emotional problems. And the reason for that, why after you've been to the moon, now where do you go? That seemed to be the end, the finish. What later astronauts did was to make sure that they had major projects lined up after they returned from the moon trip. The way you enjoy life best is to wrap up one goal and start right on the next one. Don't linger too long at the table of success. The only way to enjoy another meal is to get hungry. Another thing to check for on your list is that you have included goals for each of these three important categories. First, make sure you've listed your economic goals, your goals for income, profits, and productivity. Second, make certain your list includes material items you want, tangibles, such as a home, a car, a boat, furniture, or jewelry. Don't attach the wrong importance to things, but they are important. 
Third, you'll want to include on your list goals for personal development. Write down all your personal development goals. Your goals to be more physically fit, to lose weight, to be more decisive, to be a more effective leader, to be a better communicator, to learn another language. Of course, there are other types of goals to consider, family goals, social goals, lifestyle goals. This is pretty heavy homework, but remember, whether or not you do your homework shows up in the marketplace as well as in the classroom. After you have determined which of your goals are one year, three year, five year, and 10 year, and after you've made certain your list includes economic goals, things, and personal development goals, I want you to go back to this list again. Now pick out the four most important one-year goals, the four most important three-year goals, the four most important five-year goals, and the four most important ten-year goals. Those 16 goals will give you plenty of work for now. Get out some more paper, and in a brief paragraph, describe each goal. How high, how long, how much, what size, what model, what color, for example. Also describe why it is important to you. This is a process where you either talk yourself into it or talk yourself out of it, which is good. When you're unclear as to why something is important, usually you put only half-hearted effort into it. What you want is a powerful motivator, but the reason why you want it is an even more powerful motivator. It has greater pull. You may find that some of your goals you thought at first glance were important are not important after all. Do some reflecting, refining, and revising. The point is, Right now, try to have approximately four one-year, three-year, five-year, and ten-year goals that you truly believe in, that inspire you, that you've sold yourself on. When these goals and the reasons you want to obtain them are each clearly described in a brief paragraph, transfer this information to a journal or some type of notebook that you can carry with you easily and refer to often. It's essential to set aside some time every week to review all of your goals, to rearrange them, redo them, restructure them, to add goals, or to tear up the whole list and start over. Goal setting is not something you do just once. It's a continual process. Also, you must constantly check your progress toward your goals. You don't want to fall too far behind on, or worse, lose sight of, your important goals. Now, just as important as your long-range goals are your short-range goals. Your goals for tomorrow, next week, next month, six months from now. These are goals you can accomplish within the next year, the immediate future. We call these goals confidence builders. When you work hard, burn the midnight oil, and accomplish these little things, it builds your confidence to go for your long-range goals. Write down in your notebook or journal all the little things you would like to have or accomplish in the next year. How you set up this list is up to you. You might want to break it down by week or by month. Set it up in whatever way works well for you. Part of the fun of having a list is being able to check off something as obtained or completed. Every week, try to check off at least one thing on your list of short-term goals. And when you are able to check off something major, something on your list of long-range goals, celebrate. Make winning joyful. Congratulate yourself. It is very important to celebrate progress. We grow from two experiences. One is the joy of winning, and the other is the pain of losing. Here's what that also means. Make losing painful. Put it on yourself. If you set something up, fooled around, didn't pull it off, put it on yourself and get around people who will help in this area. Hey, don't join an easy crowd. Go where the expectations are high, where the pressure to perform is high. It's how we grow. I'm certain that part of the reason why people let goal setting slide is because it is a lot of work. As I said, you'll be constantly revising your lists of short range and long range goals, rearranging them, refining them, 
redesigning them, establishing different priorities, adding new goals, perhaps deleting others. It's interesting that so many people work hard on their jobs, but they don't work hard on their futures. They let that slide. Some people live such mediocre lives that at the end of the day, they don't know whether they're winning or losing. They just go through life with their fingers crossed. I know most people don't make definite plans, but don't let that be you. The guy says, well, you work where I work, but the time you get home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV and get to bed. You can't sit up half of the night and plan, plan, plan. And this is the guy who's behind on his car note. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But I've discovered that you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broke and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good planner, a good goal setter. You've heard the old saying, the people who fail to plan are planning to fail. It's true. So work on your plans. Put yourself in the top few percent who put this power to work for themselves. Writing your goals down also shows you are serious. And to do better, you must get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you do have to be serious. Hey, everybody hopes things will get better. But remember, the future does not get better by hope. It gets better by plan. And hope unaided by clear plans can finally become an illness. There's a Bible phrase that says, hope long delayed makes the heart sick. It's a sickness. I used to have the illness known as passive hope. It's bad. And there's one that is even worse, and that is called happy hope. That is really bad. The man is 50, and he's broke, and he's still smiling. That's bad. So get serious. Make plans. Put them on paper. My suggestion from experience. There's a phrase from the Bible that goes, without dreams and vision, we perish. How true. Humans have this unique ability to aspire, to dream, to go for something, to become something. Without that, life is not life. We must have dreams and never give up on our dreams. I'd like to share with you some further observations I've made on goal setting. Understand that your goals, whatever they are, are affecting you all day long. Your goals affect your handshake, your attitude, how you feel. Your goals affect how you look, how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, all day, every day. Your personality, conversation, activity, it's all affected by your goals. I asked a man one time, what are your goals for this month? And he said, if I could just scrape up enough money to pay these lousy bills. That was his goal. Hey, I'm not saying it isn't a goal. It is, but it's such a poor goal. It certainly isn't inspiring. You don't jump out of bed on Monday morning and say, oh boy, another chance to go out and scrape up the money to pay these lousy bills. The point is that goals should be fun. They should be big, challenging, rewarding. They should allow you to grow. Remember, too, that the major purpose of having a goal is not just to acquire the goal. The major reason for setting goals is to compel yourself to become the person it takes to achieve them. In other words, attaining the goal is of secondary importance. What's far more important is what you become in the pursuit of it. The greatest value in becoming a millionaire, for example, is not the million dollars. The greatest value is the skills, the knowledge, the discipline, and the leadership qualities you acquired in becoming a millionaire. It's the experience you acquired in planning, development, strategy. It's other qualities you acquired, such as courage, commitment, and willpower, to attract a million dollars. You could lose everything you attained but you could not lose the skills, knowledge, and experience you have obtained. Even better than having is being. Here's a most important question to spend some time answering. What kind of person will I have to become to get all I want? Write down a few thoughts on that. Write down some skills you'll have to develop, for example. 
and some of the things you're going to have to learn. Just spend a little time writing a few sentences on this. What kind of person will I have to become to get all I want? The answer to this will give you some personal development goals. Remember that income does not far exceed personal development. All of us have to do this kind of self-examination. I have to look at my own life and say, well, here's what I want, but am I willing to become what it takes to get what I want? If I'm too lazy, if I don't want to learn, read, study, and grow to become that kind of person, then I cannot attract what I want. Now, either I have to change my wants or I have to change myself. Here are a few more key points I'd like to share with you on goals and designing your future. First, if you don't right now feel as if you're equipped to get all you want, just remember, ability will grow to match your strong dreams. That's why the goal setting process we've discussed is so important. The more you work on this, the more ideas you will get on how you can change, how you can grow. I am nowhere near the person I was when I met Mr. Shove 25 years ago. I'm not that person anymore. I've changed. There's nothing you can do about the past, but you can do a great deal about your future. You don't have to be the same person you were yesterday. You can make changes in your life, absolutely startling changes, in a fairly short period of time. You can make changes you can't even conceive of now. If you give yourself a chance, your abilities will grow. You have untapped talents and potential that you haven't even reached for yet. And as time goes on, you'll be able to reach deeper and deeper. The first thing you'll know, you'll be able to do things you never thought you could do. You'll be able to handle things you never thought you could handle. You'll have ideas that you've never had before. All of this is sparked by the goal setting process. When you know what you want, and you want it badly enough, the answers will come to you. I can't tell you why it works. All I know is, it works. Give yourself a chance to become all you can become and to accomplish all you can accomplish. Let me give you a Bible philosophy that teaches how to get whatever you want. Here's what it says. Ask. That's it. Ask. Of all the important skills to learn in life, be sure to include the skill of asking. What does ask mean? Ask means, what do you want? And the complete formula is staggering. It says, ask and you will receive. Hey, we ought to look into that. The man says, yes, but you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to get a bite to eat, watch a little TV and get to bed. You can't sit up half the night and ask, ask, ask. And this guy is behind on his bills. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you've got to do better than work hard and be sincere all of your life. You'll wind up broke and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good asker. Let me give you some key points on this asking and receiving, setting goals asking of life. Here's part of the philosophy that helped me to change. First, asking starts the receiving process. Asking is like pushing a button and all this machinery starts working, mental and emotional machinery. I don't even know how it works, but I do know it works. There are a lot of things you don't need to know how they work. Just work them. Some people are always studying the roots. Others are picking the fruit. It all depends on what end of it you want in on. So asking is the beginning of receiving. Second, receiving is not the problem. You don't have to work on receiving. It's automatic. So if receiving is not the problem, what is the problem? It's failing to ask. The man says, I see it now. I got up every day this year and hit it hard, but nowhere in my house is there a list of what I want from my life? Can you see? Good worker, poor asker. Third, receiving is like the ocean. There's plenty, especially in this country. It's like an ocean here. 
Here, success is not in short supply. It isn't rationed so that when you step up to the window, it's all gone. No, no. Well, if that's true, what is the problem? Well, the problem is some people go to the ocean with a teaspoon. Have you got the picture? A teaspoon. What I suggest you do in view of the size of the ocean is trade your teaspoon for at least a bucket, and you will look better at the ocean with a bucket. Kids won't make fun of you. Now, here's something else to remember about asking. There are two ways to ask. One is ask with intelligence. It didn't say ask intelligently, but I'm sure it meant that. Don't mumble. You won't get anything by mumbling. Be clear, be specific. Intelligent asking means how high, how long, how much, when, what size, what model, what color. Describe what you want. Define it. Remember, well-defined goals are like magnets. The better you define them, the stronger they pull. And give your goals purpose. Answer both questions. What do I want? That's the object. And the second question, what for? That's purpose. Purpose is stronger than object. What you want is powerful and it will pull, but what you want it for is more powerful. Here's the second way to ask. Ask with faith. Faith is the childish part. It means believe you can get what you want like a child, not an adult. Many adults are too skeptical. They've lost that wonderful childlike faith and trust. Don't let that happen to you. Believe in, have faith in yourself and your goals. And get excited like a child. Childlike enthusiasm. Nothing can beat it. Kids think they can do anything. How exciting. They hate to go to bed at night and can't wait to get up in the morning. Develop that kind of enthusiasm toward your life and your goals. And be curious like a child. Kids can ask a thousand questions. Just when you think they're finished, they come up with a thousand more. They'll drive you to the brink. But it's really a virtue. Have plenty of curiosity. Ask questions. That's how you learn. Another fringe benefit of setting goals is what it does for your ability to manage your time effectively. This is no small thing. We'll look at time management in detail in a later session. But now, while we're talking about goals, I'd like to share a few ways your use of time are affected by or influence the achievement of your goals. Have you ever thought that without some very clear written goals, you never even need to consider managing your time? Time essentials come from objectives well-defined. Time can't be critical if objectives aren't defined. Now, you might be one of those uniquely fortunate individuals who can keep all their objectives and purposes clearly defined in their minds and operate from that. But I wouldn't take the chance. Write your goals down and set careful priorities. Sometimes priorities are determined by the season. For a farmer in springtime, the season dictates his most important activities. During the spring, a farmer must work around the clock, burn the midnight oil, and keep the equipment running because he has only this small window of time for the planting of his crops. One of the difficulties of living in an industrialized society is the losing of the sense of seasons, when to pour it on, when to ease back, when to take advantage. It's easy to keep going from nine to five, year in and year out, and lose a natural sense of priorities and appropriate time. Don't let one year just blend into the next. Keep an eye on your own seasons, lest you lose track of values and substance. Part of setting priorities is learning to separate major activities from minor activities. This is a whole skill in itself, but once you have learned it, it will pay dividends you won't believe. So learn to put everything on your mental scales to be carefully weighed before you spend time or money. And here's a good question to constantly ask. Is this a major or a minor? By asking that question, you will reduce the amazingly natural tendency to spend major time on minor things. In sales training, we are taught 
that major time is the time spent in the presence of the prospect, while minor time is the time spent on the way to the prospect. If you're not careful, you will spend more time on the way to than in the presence of. So in sales we teach, don't go across town till you've gone across the street. Wouldn't it be wise to make an evaluation if you're in sales and ask, how much time am I spending in the presence of and how much time on the way to? Majors and minors, what a great discipline to exercise. It also reads, don't spend minor time on major things. It's easy to get values mixed up. The man spends three hours watching television and only 30 minutes playing with his kids. Something is probably out of line there, right? It also reads, don't spend major money on minor things. If you spend more on candy than on audio cassettes like this or books, that would be foolish, right? Here is a great goal achieving tip. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's possible to be busy all day, come home exhausted, and only then realize that very little of your day consisted of productive activities in the pursuit of your goals. Don't get faked out by being busy. The man says, I've been going, going hard all day. I've really put in the hours and the effort. But here's the major question, doing what? It isn't going, going hard all day that counts. It's the doing what? The value that counts. Another essential is concentration. This is one of those difficult things, especially in a society where there are so many voices asking for our attention. The television voices, the radio voices, your family voices, the friends voices, social voices, business voices, advertising, commercials. Isn't it amazing? You can turn off the television and the commercials keep running. How do you turn them off in your mind? That is the challenge to be mastered. The best use of time comes from putting plenty of value in it. And concentration means you take that challenge seriously. It's called careful investment for maximum results. Concentration. The big sports stars will tell you the cost of not concentrating. Just a little slip of concentration and they put one by your feet. And there goes first place and maybe the big money. So writing a letter, concentrate. Making a call, having a conversation. Trying to solve a problem, concentrate. You won't believe the effect this will have on your life. Now there is a time to let your mind wander, but it's a time you designate specifically for that purpose. At that appointed time, you can go off for that walk on the beach or that drive to the mountains, away from business. Let the breezes blow and your mind soar. Do some dreaming. That's healthy. But do it at that pre-planned time. At all other tasks, concentrate. Another aspect of managing goals and time is constant review. There's just no way to keep on target with your priorities without this. Whether it's business goals, personal goals, family goals, or investment goals, they must all be reviewed to see if you are on track, which is all the more reason for writing them down. Careful goal setting could be the time management answer you've been looking for. Goals well-defined and well-described and well-thought-out make us look carefully at the time we have and how to get the most from it to make all of our dreams come true. The answers to do better come from the necessity to do better. You will undoubtedly be amazed at the ideas you can come up with for the use of your time when goals and purpose have you stimulated to the maximum. Now there is a last main point to consider. You won't get everything you want. What a statement to make after studying how to get whatever you want. But you won't get everything you want. And the reason is, it's not that kind of planet. Sometimes it's going to hail on your crop and rain on your parade. I'm sure you are very well aware of this. But in my opinion, if you work the system I've just shared with you, you will get more than plenty. 
more often than not, you will get what you want. Those are good odds. There's no telling what you can do when you get inspired by results in advance. There's no telling what you can accomplish when you have goals and you believe in them. Just try this system for 90 days. Just try it. It may work even better for you than it has for me. I wish that for you. Here's the big challenge of life. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That's the challenge. And of course, the other side of the coin reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you got. I have found in my experience that income does not far exceed personal development. Now, sometimes income takes a lucky jump. But sure enough, unless you grow out where it is, it'll usually come back where you are. Life has strange ways. If somebody hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly. So you get to keep the money. Otherwise, sure enough, it'll disappear. Somebody once said, if you took all the money in the world, divided it up equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets. Incredible. Success is something you attract, not something you pursue. Success is looking for a good place to stay. So instead of going after it, you work on yourself. Personal development. See, the major question to ask on the job is not what are you getting. The major question to ask on the job is what are you becoming? See, the big question is not what am I getting paid here. The big question is what am I becoming? here because true happiness is not contained in what you get happiness is contained in what you become so that's our major subject for tonight personal development of all the assignments mr shof gave me at age 25 this was probably the most difficult in fact i'm still working on this one i think it's an unending challenge to see what you can become the next subject is called basic laws And it's good to study the basics. And I call these basics primarily because they come from the Bible. Now, I'm not a theologian or a minister, and that'll be apparent. But Mr. Shelf taught me that the Bible was a good textbook for ideas and stories and success equations, how to live the better life. I found out that was true. He also taught me that the Bible is as practical as it is spiritual, and I found out that's true. If you look at your bank account and your income and you're not happy, there are several places in the Bible to check to see what the heck's wrong so you can make the changes. And we're going to cover some of those tonight called basics. Okay, the next subject is my favorite, setting goals. Mr. Shelf taught me how to set goals. What a favor that was. One morning at breakfast, shortly after I met him, he said, Jim, let me see your current list of goals and let's go over them and talk about them. He said, maybe that's the best way I can help you get a better direction started. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, is it out in the car or home somewhere? I said, uh, no, sir. I don't have a list anywhere. He said, well, young man, that's where we got to start. He said, I can tell you right now, if you don't have a list of your goals with you, he said, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would change if I had a list of goals? He said, drastically. That day I became a willing student how to set goals. And sure enough, learning how to set goals changed my life. And I often wondered why no one had ever taught me how to set goals up until age 25. I went to high school, but if they offered it, I missed it. I went to college for a year, never heard it. I worked for Sears. <laughs> really. And to my knowledge, Sears never taught it. Right? How to set goals. So here I am, age 25, married, my family starting, I've been to college, I'm working, and I still don't know how to set goals. But fortunately, when I was 25, I met the man who taught me how, and it revolutionized my whole life. Economically, socially, personally, it's incredible. So I want to share with you tonight what Mr. Shove shared with me, how to set goals. It can be a life changer. Okay, 
The next subject is the negative part of the seminar. Life is part negative, so we got to talk about the negative. And this subject is called diseases of attitude. Diseases of attitude. There's a lot of things that can wreck your chances to do well. We live in a rather dangerous world, so you've got to be not only wise, you've got to be careful. Now, attitude diseases are just as bad as physical diseases, right? High blood pressure, heart trouble. I mean, a lot of things lace your chances to do well. So you've got to be careful. And attitude diseases are deadly. I mean, they'll destroy all the good things you start. Okay? So we'll go through those attitude diseases, how to spot them, how to look for them, what they are, and, and the cure. And I'm a pro on these because I've had them all, so I can give you excellent advice on these. Now, the last subject we're going to consider tonight is called the day that turns your life around. The day that turns your life around. And under this subject, we're going to talk about the emotions that can change your life. Human beings are emotional creatures, and emotions are powerful for life change. Now, of course, emotions are so powerful, they can go either way on you. Emotions can either build or destroy. So you really have to employ emotions properly. We call civilization the intelligent management of human emotions. If you can intelligently apply your emotions in the right direction, no telling what can happen. Could turn your life around one day would be sufficient. So we'll talk about those. Okay. Now that's a lot to cover in one evening. But uh, we'll keep at it here and see if we can't get it all done. I'd like to have you now jot down the theme of the seminar. Every seminar should have a theme, I guess. We've got one. It's on some of our literature if you happen to notice it. But if you didn't, for your notes, here it is. The theme of the seminar goes like this. The major key to your better future is you. That's the theme of our seminar tonight. The major key to your better future is you. And I'd like to have you underline two words just to give it some added punch. Underline the word major and the word you. So that it reads, the major key to your better future is you. Now my first suggestion is, transfer this to a card or something where you can put it up where you can see it every day. Preferably put it up where you can see it at the beginning of the day. Before you go off to put the day together, this is a good phrase just to glance at, to keep in mind as you're putting the day together. It's called the silent seminar. If you'll just let this talk to you during the day, I found it to be tremendously helpful. The major key to your better future is you. <coughs> For a big share of my life now, I didn't have uh, this one quite figured out. Among a lot of things I didn't have quite figured out. Many things used to puzzle me back in those early days. I used to wonder why two people could work for the same company, one make twice as much money. Now see, that used to puzzle me. And maybe they were the same age, graduated from the same school, live in the same community, work for the same company, with the same products and the same services. They've got the same traffic, the same problems, and one makes a thousand a month, the other one makes two thousand a month. Now that was my puzzling question. Why would this long list be the same and the money twice as much? I asked, what's the difference between a thousand a month and two thousand a month? And I don't mean a thousand a month, right? I could figure that out. But what, what makes the difference? Why would one person do twice as well, three times as well, speaking economically? Now I know there's more than one way to do well. I understand that. But in this little narrow area called compensation, what's the difference? Well, back then, with my faulty thinking, I'm trying to reason it out. I thought, well, maybe time makes some of the difference, right? Some people do better because they have more time. I used to say, Harold ought to be able to do well. He's got a lot of time. If I had all of Harold's time, I could do well. Now, that's got to be dumb, right? Number one, you can't get somebody else's time. A guy says to me one time, he says, you know, if I had some extra time, I could make some extra money. I said, then forget it. There isn't any extra time. 
Hey, when the clock strikes 12 midnight, that about wraps it up, right? I mean, you can look around the gongs there for a little more, but it's over. You say to the guy, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for extra time. See, they'll come and take you away, right? There isn't any more time. Now, if you can't get more time, which you can't, what could you get more of that would make a difference in economic results? And here's the key word. Make it a part of your notes. We're going to consider it tonight. The word is value. And I have a little phrase for your notes. Value makes the difference in results. Value makes the difference. You can't get more time, but you can create more value. Now, here's the first lesson of economics. Everybody should learn it from the time they're old enough to understand what a dollar means, how to earn one, how to get one, how to keep one, what to do with it. First lesson of economics, we primarily get paid for value. That's lesson one. Bringing value to the marketplace, that's how you get paid. You don't get paid for the time. I know it takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but you get paid for the value, not the time. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of the evening. Is it possible to become twice as valuable at the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Could you become three times as valuable, make three times as much money in the same time? Is that possible? The answer is yes, if. And it's always if, right? Life is known as the big if. Harry Truman once said, life is iffy. How true. And here's the big if we're going to consider it tonight. It's possible to do much better at the marketplace if you go to work primarily on yourself. And that's the theme of our seminar tonight. Learning to work primarily on yourself. People have asked me for the last 24 years, how do you develop an above average income? And the answer is, become an above average person. Develop an above average handshake. Some people want to be successful, they don't even work on their handshake. As easy as that would be to start on. They let it slide, they don't understand. Develop an above average smile. Develop an above average excitement. Develop an above average interest in other people. Develop an above average intensity to win. See, that'll change everything. Probably one of the most frustrating experiences in life is looking for an above average job with above average pay without becoming an above average person. It's called frustration. And Mr. Shelf gave me probably the greatest clue he gave me when I first met him. He said, Jim, if you want to be wealthy and happy the rest of your life, just learn this lesson well. He said, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Then Mr. Shelf gave me probably one of the most important clues among so many things he taught me, but this was in those early days. Mr. Schoff was very kind, but he was also very abrupt. And he had these interesting questions to ask. I'm giving him a little rundown run down one day on how things hadn't worked out for me. He said, Mr. Owen, I've got the answer for you if you will listen carefully. And listen carefully, I did that day and for the next five years. If somebody's wealthy and happy, you got to listen. He said, Jim, I've only known you a short time. But he said, it's already my honest opinion that for things to change for you, you got to change. That wasn't quite the answer I was looking for. But that's the answer he gave me, and I pass it along to you on this warm summer evening in Anaheim, California, 1981. For things to change for you, you've got to change. Otherwise, it isn't going to change. Before I met Mr. Shelf, 
I used to say, I sure hope things will change. <laughs> right? That seemed to be my only hope. If it isn't going to change, I'm in serious trouble. And then I discovered it isn't going to change, so I'm in serious trouble. See, I can tell you what the 80s are going to be like. You have dropped into the right place. I did a seminar one time for Standard Oil executives and management in Honolulu. And uh, we're having a conference one day around this big conference table. And one of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, you know some fairly important people halfway around the world. What do you think the 80s are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. I can tell you. So they all listened very carefully. And I said, gentlemen, based on my wide experience, I can really honestly say to you, in my opinion, in the 80s, it's going to be about like it's always been. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came? That's inside. I don't pass that around just everywhere. <laughs> now, of course, I said that to make a point, but I also said it because it's accurate. It's going to be about like it's always been. It isn't going to change. The tide comes in and then what? It goes out for six and a half thousand years that we know of, recorded history, and probably long before that. So it is not going to change. It gets light and then what? It turns dark. Six and a half thousand years. See, it's not likely to change. And we're not to be startled by that. And if the sun goes down, the guy says, what's happened, what's happened? It means he hasn't been here long, I guess, right? <laughs> it always goes down about this time. <laughs> the guy says, well, I don't like that arrangement. Well, you've got to talk to somebody besides me, right? <laughs> it gets light, then it turns dark. In rotation, the next season after fall is what? Winter. Pray tell how often does winter follow fall? Every year regularly for the last six and a half thousand that we know of. See, it is not going to change. Now, some winters are long, and some are short, and some are hard, and some are easy, but they always come right after falls. It isn't going to change. Sometimes you can figure it out. Sometimes there's no way to figure it out. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it gets in a knot. Sometimes it sails along. Sometimes it gets in reverse. See, that's not going to change. The last 6,000 years reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. 